My name is Enoch Omotayo. I'm a student here at Charles Herbert Flowers High School, a part of the 3D Scholars Program. And I also have the honor to stand before you as one of the two top finalists for the student member of the Board of Education. As a part of my 3D Scholars Program here, I have the opportunity to pursue my dream as becoming an attorney and also a community activist. Through this, I have the opportunity to also take dual enrollment courses at the Prince George's Community College. I'm also a committed student leader. I currently serve as the president of the class of 2024 and the Principal Action Council, where we take the challenges of identifying ways, ways for improvement and also within our school community, creating a system structure to identify ways to address student needs. We have hosted such success, successful initiatives such as the Mental Health Awareness Forum, Anti-Bullying Campaign, Life Beyond Academics, which helps students become well around young adults. We are currently in the planning, we are currently in the process of planning an event with our CHF alumni committee, which would be turning your passion into your payday. If you would like your young adult to be part of this successful event, please have them access the register link through their PGPCS email. This evening, we will be presenting our annual state of school address. During this event, you will be hearing from our principal as he presents the important data related to our school community. You will also be given an opportunity to reflect on the data that's provided, allowing actions for improvement. As we continue our work towards our vision and mission of creating a college and career ready graduating, as we, as we continue to work, as we continue working towards our vision and mission of college and career ready graduating seniors to make sure that who are global citizens through a commitment of culture, collaboration, and critical thinking, these conversations are necessary. And the work that occurs as a result of them are also invaluable. So let's get started. It's now my honor to welcome our principal, Dr. Gorman Brown. student leaders here at the Mecca of Excellence. I greet you in the spirit of excellence and welcome, welcome you to our annual State of the School Address. Though we have been on a hiatus since 2020, these annual conversations and the subsequent recommendations that stem from them have led to some of our most effective initiatives in improving student performance. We understand that the value of our work increases exponentially when we leverage the collective ingenuity of our entire school community. It is our hope that this evening you will bring your thinking cap as we analyze salient data related to school performance, celebrate some of our outstanding students, and plan for the future success of our Mecca of Excellence. Joining us this evening, if we'll start with our student leaders, we have in the room, and you've already met him, the principal of the Principal's Action Council, Council Mr. Enoch Amatoya. We have Vice President, Ms. Sydney Asan, and we have a member of the Manhood 101 program, Boyan Tiwang. Let's give it up for Boyan, he's here. <laughs> Joining us, and from our parent leadership community, we have PTSA President Crystal Carpenter. We have the President of the Class of 2025, Shakita West. And we have the Vice President of the Class of 2025, Andrea Turk. Welcome. Also joining us are several of our school leaders, beginning with the administrators in the, in the room. We have uh, class of 2026 administrator, Mr. Randy Ware. Class of 2025 uh, administrator, Mr. Brandon Jackson. And class of 2024 administrator, Mr. Christopher Burroughs. Also joining us, our, student, our teacher leaders, uh, head of our art department, Ms. Christina Kuntz, 
testing coordinator, Ms. Ivora Washington, coordinator of our Project Lead the Way program, Ms. Victoria Lee, and the chair of our math department, Mr. Nicholas Acha. Thank you all for coming this evening and welcome to our Mecca of Excellence. This evening, I am looking forward to having conversations with you about some of the salient data and outstanding contributions that our young people are making. So welcome, and let's dig right in. our vision here. Any organization must begin with the vision and mission as all success should be measured as it relates to its goals. The vision and mission statement for Charles Herbert Flowers are all students will graduate college and career ready, caring, concerned, and capable global citizens in four years or less. This will be done through a commitment to culture, collaboration, and critical thinking. Tonight we will begin by celebrating the success of those who are working towards this collective vision. All right, well, let's start off with celebrating some of our outstanding global citizens. And so we have here two young ladies who are going through the process of uh, actually volunteering this summer. They will be working um, in, in South uh, African countries, actually volunteering their time to help uh, the, co the community organizations there so that they can um, help to further the commitment that we have to the continent of Africa. As you can see, we've also celebrated the, our, our, our relationship with the continent of Africa through the collection of bikes that went to Mo Mozambique at the beginning of the year. So let's give it up for some of our global citizens. It is sensitive. All right, well, let's talk about culture a little bit. Um, so this is the African Student Association here at Charles Herbert Flowers, one of the largest organizations of its kind in Prince George's County Public Schools. This organization um, is a great segue for the connection of our young people to the school community. They celebrate uh, their culture here within our school community and we have the opportunity to celebrate them through the work that they are doing every day. Let's celebrate our African Student Association. Let's talk a little bit about collaboration. And what we're looking at here are the collaborative efforts of the Charles Herbert Flowers Jaguars football team. This year, they were state finalists going unbeaten all the way through the state championship game. And although they fell in that game, they had an outstanding season, not just as athletes, but our football players had the highest GPA of any football team in Prince George's County Public Schools. Let's give it up for our football team. <laughs> All right, so we talked a little bit about critical thinking. And so this is an important part of what we do here at Charles Herbert Flowers High School. So what you are seeing here are a couple of our interns from the Howard University uh, School of Medicine, Tyro Omisaw and Teresa Njay. 
They are both engaged in high-level research around quantifying mucid architectural changes and different pH values to see how much reacts during a viral entry and studying the mental effects of the stigma of HIV, specifically its impact on the development of addictive behaviors respectively. Several of the interns participated in the regional science fair this past weekend, and nine of our Jaguars walked away with awards, including Ariana Bueller Jarrett, who was a grand prize award winner and will be going to the International Science Fair in Dallas. Let's give her a hand. All right, so let's have a quick conversation around district priorities. So, as we align the work that we're doing at Charles Herbert Flowers High School, our, our CEO, Dr. Monica Golson, laid out three very important points for us to focus on uh, as we are engaging in our work this school year. The first is the improvement in performance around mathematics. So our response in that regard was to develop a master schedule that supported smaller teacher-student ratio in the classroom than in any other classes within Charles Herbert Flowers. Most of our Algebra 1 classes have a student-teacher ratio of around 16 to 18 to 1, which allows for those intimate conversations, that feedback, and to help build capacity of our young people as learners. The math collaborative planning sessions that are led by Mr. Acha and Mr. Jackson and Mr. Ware are actually instrumental in this work as well. As we work towards the execution of the curriculum framework with fidelity, including to ensure that all of the required common assessments are given, which are aligned with the curriculum, which are aligned with the expectations of the midst of the MCAP assessment, which the young people will be taking um, in May. Finally, to improve uh, performance around the area of ma mathematics, we have a peer and instructor tutoring programs through Mr. Rocha's program, again, Mu Alpha Theta and our National Honor Society, which has embraced the call to ensure that all students are understanding the mathematical concepts that are placed before them every day. Another one of her charges is the call for improvement in school climate and culture. So student-led town halls focused on mental health, social life and interactions with others to improve student engagement is one way in which we have ensured that we are instilling school culture and climate as a priority. We've created a curriculum called the Flyers, Flowers Way. And the Flowers Way curriculum actually teaches our young people the history and culture of Charles Herbert Flowers High School, our mecca of excellence. It's important that if we are keeping the standards high, that our young people understand what those standards are and what it looks like in order for them to be successful. Finally, in the area of school climate and culture, we have adopted and continue to support the College Summit Program, which allows our seniors to ensure that their peers are preparing for college through the, pro through the completion of the FAFSA process, the college application process, and are actually working towards ensuring that our freshmen and sophomores are receiving information about what that process looks like moving forward. A school that has a strong school culture is a school that has the students actually leading that culture. And I'm excited that that type of investment is occurring here at Charles Herbert Flowers. Finally, Dr. Golson has charged us with working towards the social, emotional learning and mental health and the, 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 the stability of our young people. So our response has been the creation of what's called our GBED curriculum. So GBED is an acronym for getting better every day. And so our young people beginning in ninth grade are taught valuable tools around resilience in order to engage with one another and with the rigorous curriculum in which they are uh, challenged with every day. We also have, through our Principals Action Council, um, had various mental health forums and pathways for our young people to get the help that they need when they are communicating that they are struggling. So uh, joining us also this evening is uh, Shayla Adams Stafford, our staff member. I'm, I'm sorry, our, our, our school board member. I'd love to work here, though. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And also, one of our, I'm good to see one of our uh, Principals Action Council uh, members and member of Manhood 101 that was actually in the picture with our uh, governor, Wes Moore, Mr. Ayeme Owona. Welcome, sir. So our next conversation is going to be around our accountability system framework and the subsequent report card that comes from it. So this is a system that began in the 2018-2019 school year. And uh, it was placed on hiatus while we were um, enduring the, 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 uh, the worldwide pandemic, but they have now brought this system back. And the system provides us with valuable data that we can help to structure our supports and our interventions around. It starts up with academic achievement, and 30% of that report card is based on academic achievement. 15% uh, is based on graduation rate, and you'll see that graduation rate is one of the places where we can really celebrate. Another 10% is, is an area of growth for us, and that is English language proficiency. We have gone from a school that had very few English language learners to now having more than 100 English language learners with that population continuing to grow. So it is going to be our responsibility as, as instructors, as parents and as students to embrace this new population of young people that are now within our school community. So also there's the whole readiness for post-secondary success. And so that is measured, that 10% is broken to 5% for on track in ninth grade and 5% for credit for completion of well-rounded curriculum. Finally, 35% of the report card is measured on the school quality and student success, with 15% of it being broken into chronic absenteeism, 10% into a survey that is given to both our students and our staff members, and finally, 10% around opportunities to access, to access a well-rounded curriculum. So we'll have some conversations about what our data looks like in each of these areas, as well as in comparison to what it looks like uh, in other areas of our district as, as compared to the district average. So we are currently, so we are currently, based on the last year's report card, it's got a score of 57.1, which makes us a three-star school, which is 2.9 points away from being a four-star school. So guess what our goal is for this year? Four-star status. All right, this ain't the days in. And we will not be relegated to a three-star status when we know, as a mecca of excellence, our goal is always to shine in every area that is possible. So let's talk about what this looks like. And also, that 57.1 rep, uh, represents the highest high school score, uh, the second highest of all high schools, but the, 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 the high school that is closest to being four stars. So there's one regular high school that is a four-star high school, and we are the, the high school that is closest becoming the four-star high school as well. Did that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Just to make sure. 2.9 points, guys. Yeah, we're going to do it. So let's talk. Oh, let's see. You know what? This guy. All right, so let's take a look and break down where that 57.1% came from. So if we look in the first area, which is academic achievement, out of, and that is the English, and we'll talk more about that, but that's English 10 assessment and Algebra 1 assessment, we received possible 14.6 points out of the possible 30. The district average was 13 points out of a possible 30. The graduation rate, which was a, a, a celebration for us, we received 13.9 points of the possible 15 points. The district average was 11.8 uh, points of the possible 15 points. And as I stated, um, English language learners is an area of growth for us. Out of the possible 10 points, we only received 3.4 of those points with the district average being 3.1. And then finally, well, 
Next is the readiness for post-secondary success. And so the school received 6.1 of the possible 10 points, while the district received five. And finally, the school quality and student success measure, which is 35 points, we received 19.1 with a district average of 14.9. So I will break down what each one of those measures um, looked like. Now, what I will say is also that the district, the district scores improved a great deal in academic achievement this year. So there's good work going on across the district, but we want to make sure that we're focusing on the work that's occurring here at Charles Herbert Flowers. All right, so in the area of academic achievement, it's broken again, as I said, into math and to, um, and to English 10. So what you'll see here is a graph that gives you the percentage of students with taking the exam that scored at least at a score of three on the, of the MCAP Algebra 1 exam and then um, on the English 10 exam. Of course, the scores for Charles Flowers are in green. The district average is in blue. So keep it in mind that the students who take algebra in middle school would not be engaged in this assessment while they're here at Charles Flowers. 24% of the students who took Algebra 1 last year scored a level at level 3 in Algebra 1. And in the average, uh, compared to 16% within the district, uh, in English 10, our average was 56%. So an opportunity to celebrate because that 56% was actually higher than the state average in, in the area of English 10. And um, the district average was 48. So the district did improve its performance in the area of English 10. We, we did as well. So what are we currently doing? And so I want to um, commend Ms. Coons because one of the uh, values that she's brought to our school community is the conversation around arts integration as, a re as it relates to supporting math and reading. So that's one of those areas that we're committed to and we're going to continue to commit to. There's also quarterly benchmark assessments and common, common assessments that are tailored to MCAP standards and we're ensuring that those are all the students are all taking them and the student teachers are spending time analyzing the data based on that. And then there's professional development for teachers around strategies to support success through our collaborative planning process, which is built into our master schedule. So some potential pathways for future growth. So one of the things that we're looking at doing and one of the areas where we have it uh, for growth is the, the whole idea around critical thinking and the commitment to argument and writing in all content areas. So you'll begin to see, as students will begin to bring home, um, opportunities for them to engage in data-based analysis and arguments in all areas. This won't just be happening in reading. It'll be exciting to see what this looks like in art and in social studies and in science and even in mathematics for them to create arguments with support which allows them to think critically and to unmask their thinking around key areas of growth. So we're also going to help our young people define and bring some of the key uh, subject areas in mathematics to life in areas outside of just mathematics. So one of those areas is the, what a function is. And defining what a function is, not just within the realm of mathematics, but what does a function look like in science? And so we know that a function is just input and output. So in science, that would be independent and dependent variables, right? We understand that in business, when we analyze in the, st the stock market, there are things that occur and then there is a result that occurs based on the things that occur within the stock market. That is a function as well. And so the plan is to allow our young people to understand what functions are so that when they see um, relevant questions around functions on MCAP exams, it won't be the first time that they see this information in context. The next one is to provide resources to support in-house and virtual tutoring. Uh, we have invested and our district has done a great job with investing in virtual tutoring programs. But what we know is that at this point, our young people are going to need to be face-to-face -face 
in order to grapple with some of the challenging concepts that they continue to struggle with. So one of the areas of investment for next year at Charles Herbert Flowers will be to, to create a robust in-house tutoring program. And finally, professional development for educators around unlocking prompts and content area vocabulary to assist students with these processes. A lot of our students understand the process of solving problems. The, our, the kids have challenges with conceptual understanding. And so if you don't have conceptual understanding, then you don't sometimes understand what the question itself is asking you. So we'll spend time helping them understand vocabulary and unlocking props so they can understand what the question is actually asking of them. That's academic achievement, guys. All right, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about graduation rate. We're doing well here. Our four-year graduation rate uh, was 92.5. Uh, Five-year graduation rate uh, was 93.9. Um, that is um, our kids they, they, that are coming, that are staying engaged. We are working with them to get them across the stage. And not just across the stage, but into the college and career of their choice. So this is one of the areas that we're doing well, but we want to continue doing well. So what does it look like? What are we currently doing? So the district, and uh, kudos to Prince George's County Public Schools for the investment that they made in the ELP and EVP programs. These credit recovery opportunities are allowing students to make up courses that they have failed while they were in school. It's also giving kids the opportunity that passed, uh, that may have passed the course with a lower grade than they wanted to take the course over to help that GPA out some. So e EOP, a commitment to EOP and EVP is something that we're, that we're constantly doing here. Uh, semester recovery courses. So we built within our schedule the opportunity for students to take courses every day to make up for them failing in those courses last school year. So for instance, if a kid failed English 9 last year, they will have the opportunity to take English 9 every day during the first semester and English 10 every day during the second semester, which allows them to get back on track with their peers. Now this opportunity has allowed about 30, was it 31 of our students that were started the year as ninth graders have now been promoted to 10th grade because of the opportunity that this, the semester recovery courses offered them. And then the, uh, the, the professional school counselors are tracking students via a cohort tracker that was created by the district so that we get to see ongoing data of each of our students. And our grade level administrators are working with our professional school counselors to um, pr create plans during our SIT process to assist those students that are at risk of not being promoted to the next grade level. And finally, we have mo monthly communication with parents of chronically absent students. Now we saw on the report card, a part of the report card was around chronic absenteeism. Although our chronic absenteeism is one of the lowest in the county, it's still an area of improvement for us. So for those that of, the, of us that don't know, chronic absenteeism is defined by having 10 days either excused or unexcused from school. So uh, a lot of parents say, well, I sent a note to school. Uh, well, that will allow the student access to the makeup assignments, but it's still, if they are absent more than 10% of the um, attendance days, it would still place them on a chronically absent list. So what we're doing to combat that is we're providing parents with information around where their child um, exists, where they lie on the chronically absent list, and what they need to do to ensure that they, their student is, comes off of that list before the end of the year. So if you think about 180 school days, a student that has more than 18 days absent will be considered chronically absent. So if you have any questions about your child's current status, please reach out to us at the school so that we can offer you assistance in that regard. So what we're doing um, to even to increase our graduation rate even further is that we're expanding our PBIS program. And Ms. P, uh, who leads our PBIS program, is doing a great job of celebrating students to make, to make them want to come to school every day, um, doing the student of the week program, which makes kids feel like they're wanted, even doing a teacher of the week 
uh, program. So I think Mr. Miles was the teacher we celebrated this week. And so some of our, our, our uh, unheralded staff members and students are getting the opportunity to receive their kudos. So we're identifying pathways to connect students to school and, general, and, and the general community. So not every student is going to college. We have to recognize that. And so we um, are actually creating pathways for them to, uh, to pursue vocational opportunities. There was a slide in here that talked about career readiness. Don't know where it went, but I want to give kudos to uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Boykin, who leads our Academy of Fire Science that is uh, preparing our young people to, be, to graduate as firefighters and to graduate fire, with their Fighter Fighter One certification, yes, and their EMS certification as well. There we go. I'm going to work through that. I'm going to get all these acronyms and we'll get it together. <laughs> Kudos, Dr. Boykin. Let's give it to Dr. Boykin. So we are also spending time creating dialogues with at-risk students so that we can ensure that we know what it is that they need in order to be successful. And relationships is at the key, is at the core of what we do here at Charles Flowers. And then we have classroom uh, guidance counselors are going in to teach our students about self-advocacy around the grading policy. Sometimes what students understand, if, they are at a, if they're in school, if they're at a class, they have an opportunity to make up assignments that they miss, or they can ask for a retake. And that retake may be the difference between failing and passing. So uh, teaching students about the grading policy and how they can use that to uh, remain connected to the school community is another way that we do this. And then finally, having walk-in conferences with parents and students, so allowing parents to come in uh, to, to, to reconnect in real life and not just virtually. Because again, these relationships are based on us, um, on us being able to, to reach out and touch one another. So that very important commitment here. So progress um, towards English language learners as measured by the WIDA assessment. As you can see, we had 31% of our young people actually show per, uh, proficiency towards the English language um, goals that are set for them um, based on that assessment. So some of the things, and this is, we're gonna need help here, guys. So what we're currently doing is that we have self-contained ELL courses that have been added to the schedule to support newcomers and developing learners. We have a staff that has received professional development on WIDA and the can-do descriptors for level one and two uh, ELL students, and we're incorporating reading, writing, listening, and speaking strategies in all content areas. So if there are students that are, in, that are, that are ELL learners, a lot of times they need opportunities to practice the language. So, and they need to do it in an atmosphere where they feel comfortable. So if we're asking uh, all of our students to, to engage through speaking and listening, then we can actually focus on engaging our ELL students in the same process. So what we're going to need to do is to ensure that all of our educators access to ELL snapshots, the same way that we do for IEP uh, students that have special needs. We need to provide additional professional development or modified instruction for ELL students. We need to work on scheduling support to ensure there is an opportunity to provide modified instruction. And we need additional resources and translation tools uh, for students that are, that are in the general education setting so that they can engage with the curriculum without the language being a barrier. It's going to do this to me every time. OK. All right, so let's talk a little bit about readiness for post-secondary success. We received five points in this area. And so the two areas that uh, this is based on are um, the ninth grade promotion rate. And so in order for our ninth graders to be considered uh, on point, it's different than the ninth grade promotion goals for Prince George's County Public Schools. For ninth grade promotion in Prince George's County Public Schools, students must attain five total credits, one of those credits being reading, another of those credits being mathematics. 
I could, the other three credits can be of any of the other uh, six credits that they are taking during the school year. If they make that, they will be considered promoted to the 10th grade. Now, the state of Maryland, however, is requiring that ninth graders pass all of their four major courses. So a student who pa failed science but got five credits by um, passing math or reading would be considered a 10th grader the following year, but they would not con be considered on track for graduation as it relates to the Maryland State Department of Education standards. So that is something that we'll have to work through. And then the other piece with this is around the courses that our students are taking, what we're offering to our students in order for them to be ready for post-secondary success. So what are we doing here? All right, so 72% of our students receive credit for well-rounded, uh, for having access to a well-rounded curriculum. So what does that mean? So that means that 72% of our students uh, either took an AP course, um, were enro enro enrolled in dual enrollment, um, were, um, took, were finished a CTE completer program, such as our, our Fire Academy, or our computer science program. So 72% of that's, that's an opportunity to celebrate. And last year for on track in ninth grade for graduation, 72%, but we are recovering those students throughout the school year through our ELP and EVP program, the 28% that were not identified. We are recovering them and we are confident that they are going to graduate with their class in the, in the class of 2025. So we talked about what we're currently doing here is that we've created a ninth grade academy. And I want to give kudos to our, our administrators that just walked in, Mrs. Screws, ninth grade academy uh, administrator, as well as Mr. Ware. I've already given them Ms. kudos, Mrs. Screws. I want to give them your flowers too. Uh, we also, we currently offer 19 advanced placement courses here at Charles um, Herbert Flowers, and we're looking to offer even more next year. Uh, we have dual enrollment opportunities for students to go during the day. So we have a bus, not just that our 3D scholars have the opportunity to take advantage of, but any student who qualifies for dual enrollment can get on a bus here after second period, go to Prince George's County Community College, and take advantage of dual enrollment. So that is something that we've had since State Bill, I think it's 740, was um, created about eight years ago. And then we offer a plethora of CTE and specialty programs uh, to include 3D scholars, science and tech, our fire science program, Academy of Fire Science, uh, our computer science program, our Academy of Business and Finance, our Project Lead the Way program which does a great job of preparing our engineers in order to be successful. So uh, Charles Flowers offers pathways for young people and it's reflected in what you see as, as it relates to the 72% of them that are uh, ready for college or being exposed for college. And then, so what we're gonna do moving forward. So there, there may be an opportunity for us to offer dual enrollment in the building. You know, if they don't have to go to, to Prince George's Community College, we may be able to offer classroom settings such as this where they're to actually taking English 1010 in the building which they're in all day. Make it yeah, I make it happen. Yes, that is one of our goals. So I really like this new African American Studies and Government um, uh, program that they have, this AP um, African American Studies program, and that is something that we're vying for. Right, Dr. Boykin? Absolutely. And uh, our government seminar. Yeah. So Mrs. Mrs. Jones is going to be excited to know that we're, at, we're also vying to add the Media Art CTE program here as well, which comes with a lot of resources. So she's been doing an, an excellent job of running our TV productions program uh, since, and I guess she's been here a while now. <laughs> and, and the reason we're able to pull this off tonight is because Ms. Jones and the students in our TV productions program. So let's give them some kudos. <laughs> Excellent work. Good job. So that's the readiness for post-secondary success. 
And then school quality and success, uh, there are some opportunities to, for growth here, but we're actually doing okay in comparison uh, to other spaces, but not good enough for us. All right, not good enough for us. All right, so this is, uh, student, there's, there's a survey that is given to students and staff members that is worth 10 points in this regard. Another 15 points of this is measured on um, how students are um, not chronically absent. And then the last 10 points of this is chronically absent and it's a school survey. And then the access to well-rounded curriculum, which also includes how they're performing. Are they not just involved in these courses, but are they actually passing the exams that are associated with the courses? So students may take advanced placement, but they would not get credit for, uh, for having credit for well-rounded curriculum unless they pass the assessment. If they pass the dual enrollment course, however, they would get credit for access as well as credit for well-rounded curriculum. So think about that when you're thinking about taking advantage of the dual enrollment program. All right, so what we're currently doing is that we're monitoring attendance processes and communicating with families, supporting a variety of clubs and activities. And so we know that reconnecting students to the school community is really about allowing them to see themselves with their peers doing things outside of the classroom. So having a robust offering of clubs and activities is something that we've always done. And now that we're getting uh, back from um, the pandemic, is something that we're going to continue to do and we'll provide transportation to support it. All right. So we talked about the student and staff member of the week program, and we're implementing PBIS to celebrate students that normally are not celebrated, not just students who make honor roll, students that are showing growth, students that are, that are being kind, students that are, are, are doing things that may not always be measured. Uh, get an opportunity to be celebrated at PBI PBIS, and then to expand our PBIS program to include students who have demonstrated improvement, allocate additional resources to celebrate student success, and to host listening sessions to discuss school culture and climate. And so I want to make sure, as one of the outcomes of this conversation, that we start to create some subcommittees that include parents, that, com that include uh, community members, students and teachers around what we can do together to improve student performance and the climate and culture here at Charles Flowers. So we also sent a, um, a survey around what you thought the priorities were. And so we've received about 500 uh, responses. And so the, these are the top 10. So SAT preparation is still, even though a lot of schools are not requiring it, we're not going to fall for that. We're going to make sure our kids are ready to be successful on SAT. We're also going to continue to invest in because they see value in the Flowers 101 Life Skills Program, as well as more character development. Transportation for dual enrollment, as well as after school activities. Resume writing and writing up essays for college scholarships and for college admittance. So some writers workshops, something that we could be doing after school and we have buses to take students home. Uh, we opened up our school store again. And so having spirit items and merchandise and uniforms and IDs all in one space with a, with a smiling face to assist our young people on a daily basis is something of a, of a win this school year and uh, something that people seem to appreciate. Expanding our community partnerships and sponsorship, um, celebrating student success, and then finally, more professional mentors for students so they can see themselves as professionals. So some of the student-based budget initiatives that we um, invested in this year were student awards and celebrations, materials of instruction to assist with technology immersion, more curriculum writing around our Flowers Way curriculum. We were able to get out the building and send about 15 groups of kids out on college tours this year. That was exciting. You just don't understand how important it is for our kids to see themselves on college campuses. So we also did uniform purchases for families in need, an additional, able to purchase two additional security assistance 
uh, this school year, and we reestablished the school store. We talked about that. So some of the other areas for considered uh, for investment is it improves the student performance in the area of mathematics, and we talked about some of those I ideas with live tutoring. Um, opportunities for kids to connect one-on-one -on -one and with a peer or with an adult where necessary. Uh, continue investment in support, safety and support. So having those two additional security officers helped. We will also be looking at uh, other ways to ensure that our students are safe um, and the district is looking at invest investing in uh, different technologies will that will help them detect what, what people are bringing in our building. Uh, SAT and ACT preparation and expanded dual enrollment opportunities. Transportation, we talked about writing workshops and additional recommendations, and this is where you guys will come in. Additional recommendations for the school, from the school community. From those in this room and from those on air. It's important that we hear from you as we prepare to design our budget for school year 2024. So our next steps is that we have heard that we will be receiving our, our school-based, uh, student-based budget next week. And so the student-based budget allows us to know what resources we will have to staff our building and to invest in these discretionary items that we've discussed tonight. We are currently um, at around 2,580 students enrolled. So we should receive resources for all students that are anticipated to be at Charles Flowers next school year. So we'll present the ballot budget allocations to the school leadership team and establish staffing allocations based on our projected enrollment. We have to ensure that keeping the student teacher ratio is one of our priorities. So the spending of our student based budget a majority of it on purchasing classroom teachers will have to remain a priority if we're gonna keep those teacher-student ratios a priority. And then assigning discretionary funds to school prior priorities established by members of the leadership team and the school community. So we will meet again in April to, after we've collected information from you guys, had our conversations, within our instructional management team, within our PTSA, within our parent support groups, collected that information. We will come back to you and let you know how we have allocated the discretionary funds that are associated with our student-based budget. Yeah, we talked about that. Okay, so that is our presentation for this evening before I transition into the question and answer section of tonight's presentation. I would like to present um, some important upcoming dates. Of course, the most important being that June 1st graduation date, right, Mr. Miller? Absolutely. Uh, next week, and so this is important, we need to let our young people know about this and have this conversation with them. Our student survey, which is worth seven points on our report card, will be given to students next week. All right? So I am tasking our Principals Action Council. I am tasking our Manhood 101 students, our Student Government Association. I am tasking them to act as student leaders to talk about the importance of this student survey. Okay? All right. I get a yes, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, when we get back from spring break, the English 10 MCAP will be held from the 13th of April to the 27th of April. It's four 70-minute sessions that our 10th graders will be engaging in, so they'll take one session per period. Our advanced, advanced placement testing occurs from May 1st to May 12th. The schedule for those advanced placement exams uh, is forthcoming, and our Algebra 1 test 
it was pushed back to May 5th, I'm sorry, May 9th through the 16th because that is the end of the window. It allows our teachers to engage our kids a little bit longer to ensure they cover all of the information prior to the assessment. Our 10th graders are gonna be busy because they also have to take the MISA biology assessment and the Ellison government assessment. That's, those assessments will be given on the 15th and the 18th respectively and the, uh, and the 22nd and the 25th. Other calendar dates. We are currently seven days out from the end of the third quarter. Parents, please make sure you're drumming that in your young person's head. As the weather is beginning to break, the uh, focus of some of our young people is beginning to wane. This is not time for that to occur. Let us get them focused through spring break. Let's, and then allow them to enjoy some time away. But next week, Thursday, is two things. It's the last day of the third quarter, and it's the last day before spring break. Thank the scheduling gods for that. On the 31st, it will actually be the first day of the first, fourth quarter, but we will have what's, what's called an asynchronous day, an asynchronous half day where students or teachers are not responsible for coming to school but teachers will be posting assignments during first and second period in order for those students to complete. And it's the first assignment for the fourth quarter. Last time we had an asynchronous day, we did a social emotional learning um, activity. And so we're looking at doing a joint math activity along with goal setting for fourth quarter as the activities that the kids will be doing during those asynchronous day. Uh, spring break, the 3rd through the 10th, we're excited that we're bringing the evening of excellence back. On April 20th, we will be celebrating all of our students that have a year-to-date GPA of 3.5 or higher. <laughs> that will be a black tie event. We're going to ask our young people to come in business, uh, business casual. Business, business attire. And uh, last time we did this, we celebrated over 700 students. I anticipate after third quarter, we will be doing the same. Schools closed on April 21st, and then uh, our seniors' last day is on May 12th. Seniors' last day, we'll miss them. Um, the next day off will be Memorial Day, and then two days later, our annual graduation, followed by our final exams the week of June 6th through the 10th, and then our last day of school is currently scheduled for June 15th, but I'm wondering if that might not change because we didn't use any of those snow days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that, right? <laughs> All right, so that is um, what we have for you this evening. I will now carve some time out to answer any questions. Um, if you are online, if you go to the school's website, we have linked a form that you can submit your questions and our moderator, Ms. Jo uh, Ms. Jones, will be uh, identifying, reading, presenting those questions and I'll be either providing you responses tonight or providing you with responses in the near future. Are there any questions in the audience or any, any statements in the audience? Ms. Stepper, Adam Stepper. I'm very biased toward flowers. Mm -hmm. Even though <laughs> I was, oh yeah, yeah, maybe you could come to the microphone, turn the camera. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs>
So we all our board members make that commitment tonight. Thank you, Mrs. Adam Stafford. And uh, thank you for our kudos, but our staff is outstanding. I have never been around a group of committed, uh, committed professionals like this. Uh, they are, they have a good time. So they, they, they like cracking jokes and, and having a great time, but they are committed to the success of our young people. So kudos to you guys. Are there any questions in the chat? Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Um, so I want to first ditto what um, our board member just said. You got to come up to the mic. Also, say what? Okay. Because we want the audience to be able to hear your question as well. So first, thank you for your presentation. It was very informative. You're um, very few surprises, because <laughs> this is definitely the mecca of excellence. My question as a parent is, what steps can parents take to become a greater resource to our children? Um, can we have a parental guidance night for us to be tutored by our students' teachers so that we can advocate more for them behind the scenes? Because sometimes parents don't know the information. And with, I'm sorry, the new math, <laughs> I've had, you talk about arguments, I know how to have an argument um, about conceptual things and functions because it's being taught differently mm -hmm. and I learned it. And yeah. so my daughter doesn't want to make her teachers upset by doing it the way mommy said. Mm. And so how do we get tutored so we can help you more at home? Wow, that's excellent. Excellent question. So I know Ms. Jones and I had a conversation, I think Ms. Mack, were you a part of this when we talked about the Parent Academy and creating a Parent Academy for next year? So we have monthly sessions as a part of PTSA uh, to actually uh, carve out time to teach how you can advocate for your young person, learning about the administrative procedures that, so, that, uh, that, that control the school system, and also key cons concepts that students will be learning based on grade level. Another one of the things that we are in discussion about is the concept maps. And so concept maps will allow you to have an understanding of what your child is learning in each course during that period of time. And it also allows teachers to take a look at what may be taught in geometry that'll support what's going on in biology. All right, so uh, we're looking at having these published concept maps as a part of our work for next school year. Thank you for your question. Mr. Owona? <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Principal Brown. Uh, good evening to those online. Uh, my question to you is um, from the perspective of a student leader, uh, just to kind of piggyback off of what this amazing community member said, one of my goals as a student leader is to enhance our student engagement. And so much like the professional development that we have for teachers and, stu and staff, how can we um, start to you know, incite those, those same principles into our student leaders, those select few that can help help our staff and our leadership and administration team while in the building um, to help you with the goals of that community engagement that we're looking for? Excellent question, Ayime. So um, last year, we hosted within our Principals Action Council a leadership summit. And uh, we had some amazing speakers come out. And I think we spent about, a, I think it was only about a half a day that we actually had. So we're looking at developing that leadership summit and to be something that's more of continuous workshops so that we can help to develop our young leaders and to be able to articulate their, the challenges, advocate for themselves and their peers, as well as create systems and structures that will support the work that we're doing here at um, Charles Herbert Flowers. So as a member of the Principals Action Council, you're gonna be leading some of that work, sir. So <laughs> look forward to it, right? I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Yume. Thank you for your question. Other questions this evening? Are there any, is there anything online? Yes. Uh, 
good evening. Uh, we have several questions from the community. Some of these questions have already been addressed. Um, so for those watching online, if we do not respond to your question, please know that it was addressed in the presentation and you will be have, you'll have an opportunity to watch it on YouTube in repeat. And we'll, pres and we'll actually post the, the, um, the presentation online as well on well, the website. We will post the presentation online as well as um, some of these questions Dr. Brown will address in his uh, parent newsletter. Okay, I'm, I, I'm going to read the second part of this question. How will transportation for after school activities work? So the challenge with after school activities is that we have such a broad reach here at Charles Herbert Flowers that it's tough for us to provide after school transportation for every community that we service. We have students that live as far south as Pennsylvania Avenue, as far north as, um, as Route 50, as far west as the DC border, and as far east as the Anne Arundel County border. So to uh, provide activity buses for every community is going to be tough. We will be looking at use, utilizing a hub system so that if, the, if you live within our community, then you'll be able to um, get within walking distance of your home. But if you live outside of our community, you may be dropped off at a hub that is a mile or two from your from your home and just have to have somebody pick you up from there. So we'll have to we'll have to create uh, we'll have to create in, in conjunction with with transportation what that looks like. Thank you. Uh, the next question is what is the deadline for current juniors to sign up for dual enrollment and what is the benefit for college credits if not attending a Maryland school? Okay, so I will, because I don't want to give out information that, that, that may be erroneous, so I will get the information around dual enrollment and have it posted, what the deadline is. Now, but what I will say is that most states are accepting dual enrollment credits now. So if, if, if for nothing else, uh, the opportunity to have those credits transferred is, is one benefit, but the other benefit is to have um, exposure to college curriculum uh, in preparation for college. So that absolutely is a benefit. Uh, another parent would like to know when the results of the SAT that was recently taken by 11th graders will be posted. Uh, Ms. We don't post them, the kids have to go to their college board account that they created and they can see their scores. And we have not so gotten back on so once we are alerted that that data is available, we'll let the school community know, and then each student will need to go into their college board account to see what their score is on the recent SAT. Okay, but and our student leaders are saying uh, that should be posted in the portal uh, by March 23rd. Okay, good. March 23rd, good. Another question, uh, are there any field trips planned for HBCUs in the South? So, <laughs> as, a, as, a, um, as a teacher in my former life, I used to take a group of students on a uh, spring break excursion. We would go for seven or eight days, and we would go as far south as Florida and visit some of the schools. I think we went, I think the further south we went to was uh, Daytona Beach to Bethune-Cookman. And uh, we saw 10 or 11 colleges, um, and it was a great experience for those young people. Now, what I will say is that uh, the requirements for overnight trips has changed so much that it's tough to, um, to schedule trips to anywhere that is, that, is, that is outside of a day's reach. Now, what that does mean is that we can get down, we can get as far south as North Carolina and South Carolina but to get to Atlanta and back in a day would be tough. Mm -hmm. uh, next question, uh, is it possible to implement the peer success mentoring program for ninth graders uh, for the ninth grade success academy and also implement the same for all, all other grades within the building? So our, what we know about ninth graders and graduations, if they start strong, they will finish strong. 
And so we allocate a, a additional resources for our ninth graders because we know that they need it during that transition. We also recognize that our students that are in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade need similar supports. So we're going to be using our, we, and we currently are using our Peer Forward program. Um, we offer Peer Forward um, uh, classes in 10th grade as, as, as soon as 10th grade, which allows students to engage with similar, uh, similar types of supports within the curriculum. Yes. Okay, next question uh, surrounds COVID illness and absences, how that affects attendance. Uh, a parent said that they received a letter uh, stated that a uh, voicemail, I'm sorry, that their child was absent. Um, I'm sorry, there are a couple of questions about attendance. Uh, mm -hmm. Apparently received a letter about attendance, um, but they know when children aren't feeling well, they should not come to school due to COVID. Correct. Um, this child has been sick and has had COVID this year. Yes. So they're concerned about how this is affecting uh, their attendance. So what I will say emphatically is that if your child is sick, do not send them to school, right? Um, you know, COVID is still um, wreaking havoc, uh, and we don't want them to get their classmates or their instructors sick. Um, unfortunately, we don't control um, the, chronic, the chronic absenteeism uh, definition. So whenever a child is out, they will receive communication to say that they're out. Now that absence will be excused. They'll still get the opportunity to make up their assignments, but it does not remove them from a chronically absent consideration. I think it's the question. So if you receive the letter, and we're required to send a letter monthly to every student who is currently chronically absent. So for instance, we are at around 130 days, 135 school days at this point. So anybody who's been absent 13.5 days or more, excused or unexcused, would get a letter. And I know that, that receiving that letter can be a bit disturbing. It is our responsibility to send that letter, however. Uh, we want your child in school, but we want them to be in school well, all right? And there's no academic um, penalty for an excused absence. So if they need to stay home, make sure that you use the website to post the student attendance uh, letter so that they can get all the makeup work that they need. Uh, we have a parent that's asking if there can be a, a data comparison between the county Charles Flowers and the state. And I know that you've shared that with us mm -hmm. in our faculty meetings. Yep. Um, I, I'm assuming this parent would like to have that information as well. Sure. So um, I can provide some um, additional data slides when I post the information online um, so we can compare performance on the state and the district and school. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another parent who is concerned uh, and wants to know if there's a plan in place for educators who are out on leave for extended periods of time. So um, that has been a challenge. Um, I, I recognize that as we've transitioned back from the pandemic, there have been several uh, times, unfortunately, where teachers have had to take extended leave. And um, our educators are often torn and worn thin because they're responsible for covering not only their class, but the class in which um, um, the teacher is absent from. So what I will say to you is that we always ensure that the department chair provides um, a continuous access to the curriculum for the students that have a uh, teacher that is absent, as well as um, there is an educator that's placed on the grade book to grade the assignments, and then we try to have a consistent substitute in that classroom to support those young people while the teacher is out. It doesn't always work that way, but it is something that we like, that we, that we plan for. Okay. Uh, another question is, how will the school be contributing towards students getting internships? Oh, great, great question. So um, if the young person is a part of the science and technology program, 
then uh, Ms. Karen Shelton is the person who oversees the interns uh, for Science and Tech. If the student is not a part of the Science and Tech program, then they would see Dr. May. Dr. May runs our uh, College of Career Readiness uh, program, and she actually, um, otherwise known as work study, and so she has opportunities for students to get internships and exposure outside of the school community uh, while being enrolled as well. And we also send lots of internships and opportunities through student emails as well as posting them on the website so that uh, parents can be aware and students can take advantage of those opportunities. Okay, and this is the final question that I see in the chat. Okay. What guidelines do you have in place to ensure that CHF is a drug-free school and environment? <laughs> All right, so this is the elephant in the room. The state of Maryland has legalized marijuana for people above the age of 21. It is not legal in schools. It is not legal for people under the age of 21. But there are a large number of our young people who seem to not know that that's the case. So we utilize our mental health specialist. We have assemblies for young people. We've actually are planning to have a fentanyl um, awareness session uh, next week. And we are doing everything that we can to help our young people make better choices around drug use. it's not always working. Um, this is something that we have to, that we're gonna have to take on head on. I think for the first time in my, um, in my history as a principal, and I've been a principal now for 18 years, that the largest number of suspensions have come for something other than fighting. It's been drug use. We will not allow if it is brought to our attention, a student who smells that reeks of marijuana to remain in the classroom. It is not the other student's choices, and they shouldn't have to suffer from uh, having that student be in the classroom with them. We will remove them from the classroom environment. If they are found to be in possession of illegal substances, and that includes edibles, they will be disciplined in accordance with the student rights and responsibilities. If they are found to be distributing illegal substances, they will be disciplined as it relates to the student's rights and responsibility up to and including expulsion request. If young people are going to make this decision, they cannot impede on the learning environment for their peers when they do so. We have got to make it, and I know we had this conversation in the Principals Action Council about do you not hear, right? This is not the space. This is a safe space for our children and for our adults. And the scourge of drug use is something that is endangering that currently. We've got work to do. Another question popped up. Um, can restorative practices be used to support the drug-free school policy? So yes, when, when students return from suspension, um, we allow them to spend time with our mental health clinician. Uh, we try to acclimate them back into the school community uh, through the process of, of, of allowing them to develop relationships with professional school counselors. Um, but yes, uh, I, I think things like restorative circles would be a strategy that could be used to help to, to acclimate students back into the school community. And there are no other questions at this time. All right, well, thank you so much. So closing us out this evening will be Miss Sydney Assan. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. I am Sydney Hassan, the Vice President of the Principals Action Council, and an 11th grade student enrolled in the Science and Technology program. Thank you all for participating in this evening's event. As we continue in our quest for excellence, we need your help. Please provide feedback on suggestions for continued improvement via the Google form that will be placed on our website after tonight's event. We will return in April to discuss who the school's student-based budget was allocated to and to support the initiatives that were identified as being a priority on tonight's event as well as your feedback. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful evening.